this make any noises? Hello? Hi. Is it on? Yes, I guess it's on. Hello? Hi. Thought maybe we'd get, we'd get started. Um, my name is Doralyn Pines, and I am the, a member of the class of 1969 and the chair of Project Continuum. I'll tell you about what Project Continuum is in a minute. And I want to welcome you to the committee's first event of the 2016-2017 year. Um, Project Continuum is one of Barnard's Alumni Association committees. Its mission is to bring together alumni who graduated 30 or more years ago. We used to have a slightly different description, but this is much better. And, um, <laughs> and to promote dialogue around the diverse personal and professional issues they face. That comes right out of the mission statement. Um, who knew that when we scheduled this event, and this is really true, so many months ago that it would take place the day after the first presidential d debate? We, had, we really had no idea. Um, very pleased to introduce Professor Michael Miller, a member of the political science department since 2014. Uh, Professor Miller teaches courses on American elections and political behavior, research methods, public policy, and state politics. His research, his research focuses on American elections, campaign finance, election administration, and political behavior. He's the author and co-author of two recent books, including Subsidizing Democracy, How Public Funding Changes Elections, and How It Can Work in the Future, and Super PAC, Explanation Point money, elections, and voters after Citizens United, and of numerous articles and book chapters. Prior to becoming an academic, Professor Miller was a campaign consultant on federal races, managing a number of campaigns for the House, and serving as a Senate senior strategist on a Senate race. I also want to say how grateful we are to Professor Miller for stepping in for Professor Richard Pius, almost at the last minute. I'd also like to thank Professor Emerita Flora Davidson, who made the initial con connection to Professor Pius. Professor Miller. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I'll try to keep the mic on me. I generally am quite rangy. I, I like to say no podium can contain me, uh, but I will try to uh, work with the AV tonight. I was asked to give a talk this evening on a very simple question reflected in the title, which of these people will win this election? I'm going to do my best to answer that question uh, and give you a, a sense of what political science can tell us about it. In doing so, though, I want to show you some uh, inside baseball on how forecasting works. I think we uh, tend to approach this process as magic. It's the people who do it are wizards, and I don't understand what's happening. I'm going I'm to tell you how I would call this race, and I have uh, called, I forgot to give you this detail, but I have also called races for CBS News in Chicago, so I can tell you how that works too. All of my experience, academic, uh, campaign consultant, and as an applied statistician, which I am by training, will, will come in tonight. Uh, so in short, I'm going to help you win Facebook uh, this evening. I may not make it to my 45 limit. I will do my best. I also want to just give you a heads up that I'm going to show you some ads tonight. and One of them contains fairly aggressive language uh, with regard to race. Uh, we are going to be uh, having so much fun by the end of this that if I do go over, I hope you won't notice. So I want to begin by uh, challenging a meme that's been thrust upon you by the media about how elections are conducted. We're taught to think about campaigns as wire-to-wire -wire affairs, the horse race. We talk about candidates, how they come out of the gate. Did Trump get out of the gate? Did Clinton get out of the gate? We talk about how they're doing in the backstretch season, the summer doldrums when no one's paying attention, that August season when only I am watching the, the election. We talk about whether they're ahead or behind. You can turn on literally any news source today and you will see that happening. Is the as the debate altered, who's ahead or behind in this race? Momentum is a concept that the media talk about all the time. And uh, this is absolutely, in our perspective, m most of us in the field of political science, we see this as absolutely the wrong way uh, to think about an election. It's built on a false foundation, and it is my fiduciary duty, I think, <laughs> to tell you that 
before I tell you anything else. So I need to give you just a little bit of baseline here. We've grown quite comfortable with stories like this one that appeared last week, actually yesterday, in Real Clear Politics, in the run-up to yesterday's debate. They make sense to us because we've been trained by the media to think about two horses coming out of the gate, neck and neck, momentum changing. Who's it going to be, right? They make sense to us. The phrase game changer is the most overused one in politics. I'll say more about that later. And it's all part of the fraud. The media create these horse race narratives because they need us to keep watching. Who's ahead and who's behind, and especially the concept of momentum or fabrications created by an institution whose only interest is the manufacture of seemingly important narrative. We have become a nation fascinated by polls, and while out of one side of our mouth we extol on social media the polls that support how we want things to be. Right? My candidate is winning, we say. Uh, we suppress the ones with the wrong conclusions. We ignore them. We, we, we recognize that all polls contain an element of error, and at some level they measure public support or vote intent for a politician at any moment, but we rarely stop to think about what this means. The assumption promulgated by those who need our eyes continuously glued to the process is that there is a great middle, a squishy middle of American voters, and, that's, and they're, they're just waiting to be persuaded. This is familiar to you. How will the independents vote? How did last night affect the independent voters? That's the question that everybody is talking about. And that's precisely the first thing that we need to correct. The claim that we hear all the time is that, you know, elections are determined by that one third of the electorate, the, the great middle. And when political scientists hear that, we, we generally respond like this. <laughs> now, something completely different. This is how I want you to understand independent voters. Stay with me. My students, by the end of a semester, come to refer to independent voters as Sasquatches because the evidence for neither of these creatures is very good. We are all partisans in America. Despite what the media is telling you about a third of the electorate in the left, a third on the right, and a third in the middle, 92% of us have reliable partisan identifications. We just lie to pollsters because we don't want to feel like anybody tells us how to vote. So I, I call people up in a poll and I say, are you Democrat and Independent, Republican or what? And they say, I'm an Independent. I say, great, how'd you vote in the last six uh, presidential elections? And they say, for the Republicans. And so when you look at behavior, you can see that we're all reliable partisan. We may defect in some elections or become demoralized and, and sit some elections out, but there's one thing you should take from everything else I'm going to say tonight is this. The media story of two people trying to persuade a great waffling middle is a false construction. You're being bamboozled. As Exhibit A, I'll say, find me the people who voted for Obama last time who in this election are going to break for Trump besides your uncle. Everybody's got one uncle. <laughs> we would need to see millions of uncles for that narrative to be, to be correct. And if the explanations in the media and what I call the punditocracy are correct, then we need to go to another conclusion. How do you win an election? And the answer, we think, is by identifying your partisans and getting them in the polls. It's as simple as that. If everyone is partisan, you need the task before you is to know who those people are and get them out to vote. It's true today, it's been true forever, and we need to think about elections that way. If you can accept that there are many fewer part, moving parts in this system than you want there to be, than the media are trying to convince you that there are, we can go quite a long way tonight down the road of looking ahead at what's going to happen. So now, I'll give you a play in three acts. How do we call an election? Well, political science and polling science and all these things can merge. Act one, the fundamentals. Now, the fundamentals is the thing that political scientists use to describe the, way, the things that we cannot change and a candidate can't change about the race. It's just the way the board is set up. This is the game that you have to play. 
You may not always like how the pieces are set up, but it's the game that you have to play. And what does that mean in the context of an election? There are economic fundamentals, and we think these are very important. There are also political fundamentals. But Bill Clinton, when he ran in 1992, articulated very well what the notion of, the fundam of what fundamentals are in determining an election. It's the economy, stupid. We need to be talking about it. That's what people care about. He recognized that. If we know this, uh, some, some things, we can predict elections fairly accurately. If we know pieces of information, for instance, about the, ec the economy and its trends, how the economy is moving versus where it is, it's much more important. If we know presidential approval, how popular is the incumbent. And if we know how long that party has held the White House, I'm going to blow your mind right now, I can predict an election in April of the election year with 85% certainty. Most voters decide that early in the election cycle. Why? Because we're all partisan. Because very few of us cross over. If you search your feelings, as Darth Vader used to say, you'll know it's true. <laughs> they don't change their minds as the events of the campaign unfold. Basically, no one changed their mind last night. Go to Facebook and you can see that playing out right now. It's flowing through me in the air. So if we have this information, we can do a pretty good job predicting the outcome of elections. Here's Exhibit A on that point. What you're seeing is a plot. Uh, every year that you see is the outcome of the election. The horizontal axis shows you the incumbent party's percentage of the major party vote. And that's graphed against the change in the gross domestic product of the United States for the first six months of the election. That's when people are really forming their preferences. Am I better off today than I was four years ago? And if the economy is growing, more people will respond in the affirmative. You can see on this plot that as growth goes up, so too does the fortune of the incumbent party. And we want growth right around, you know, usually to be on the safe side, we actually bounce this up and say we want it to be about 2% before we start feeling good about the fortunes of the uh, incumbent party. We do that because you'll see that very few elections are actually on that prediction line. In fact, there's quite a few that are below. So this would be examples of the incumbent party underperforming. And so where are we in this race? We're right here. All right. Growth in the first six months of 2016 is 1 1.8 points, which would portend well, it seems, for the Democrats, would put Hillary Clinton at about 52.5% uh, of the vote. But again, I'll remind you, as you before, you know, if you're a Hillary fan, uh, before you start celebrating on the basis of this information, I'll remind you that there is quite a lot of bounds in these numbers. So we have to look at more than one thing. So let's look at presidential approval. I've made this graph a little more palatable for you by giving you quadrants in the green lines. In the top right, you can see a lot of incumbents who won elect incumbent parties that won elections in years when their sitting president was popular. So when, when the sitting president has a high approval rating, his party, I'll say his because they've all been men so far, his party has done well. Not, and the converse is true. And you don't see any points here, right? So this is a pretty tight line with pretty decent predictive power if we just break it into quadrants. And where is Barack Obama's aggregated approval rating today, you might ask? See how that green line just turned to red? It's at almost exactly 50%. Now, this implies a very close election. I will give you good news and bad news. The good news is Obama's poll, is Obama's, in, Obama's approval rating is trending upwards as we speak. Every month he's doing a little bit better. That would suggest that there will be some pull for Hillary Clinton uh, as you go on. The bad news, if you're a Hillary supporter, is that this effect is heavily moderated by the length of time that the incumbent party has held office. So with the Democrats now re defending the office for two consecutive cycles, that should actually serve as a break uh, on this effect. And so what we're really seeing here is that the basic economic and fundamentals imply a toss-up race, basically a coin toss. We need to remember there have been two terms of democratic presidency, 
And with, for that, with that in mind, I would actually say that the economic fundamentals in a generic Democrat versus a generic Republican, the Republican should be expected to, to win uh, in this election. There are other factors that matter, though. Certain other economic indicators, like unemployment and income growth, though they're usually correlated with GDP. It's why we use that. And so I would say that the fundamentals here give a slight edge to Trump. And in most other election years, most other election years, I would be fairly confident to start making uh, predictions using this information. I did it in 2012, and the students thought I was like mystical, right? Here's how political scientists actually do this. This is an economic fundamentals prediction model by a scholar named um, Abramowitz. And uh, he uses economic and uh, political fundamentals into his model as, as predictors. You can see that the president's approval goes in here, the GDP growth, and whether or not it's the first term in office for the incumbent party. Now, I know all this is Greek with no context, so uh, we highlighted the predictors. You can see that since 1988, this model has correctly predicted the winner of the election uh, every time. Um, does anyone want to see what it predicts this year? Alan's predicting a Trump victory with a probability of 66% confidence. However, he's been pretty forthright that he thinks this year might be a, a wrong prediction for reasons that I'm going to tell you shortly. But he does believe he can, he can predict within a margin of error a Clinton vote share of 48.6% using only these data. Does not matter, in other words, the argument for many political scientists, nothing else matters. Candidate attributes, day-to-day -day events of the campaign, ground game, Nothing else matters most of the time, in fact, 85% of the time, and in his case, 100% of the time, we've been able to call a race using only these, these fundamentals information. We have seen other examples of political scientists using fundamental models to make headlines. Right? This is a different model by Helmut Norputh, and uh, he's out at Stony Brook, and his model weighs heavily the political fundamentals, much less focus on the economy in his model. He has also successfully predicted the results of the last five presidential elections with his model, and he is also forecasting a, a victory for Trump with confidence of 87%. Norputh's model relies on the pendulum effect. He believes that voters oscillate between preferences uh, between Democrats and Republicans running things. It's just a, it's a thermostatic effect is the best way to understand it. And as I said, last five elections, right. And so people look at these models and they reach, you know, students especially will say, okay, so I can conclude then that the campaign itself actually has no bearing on the, on the outcome of the race. And that is not quite right. And in fact, this time, I think it's really wrong. Uh, so I'm not arguing at all that the fundamentals in this election are determinative and can be used on their own for prediction. These either or, is it the fundamentals, is it the campaign? These kinds of comparisons are not helpful right now. Uh, we need to understand what we have to work with in this election. Campaigns exist within the political economic environment. They point people to the fundamentals. That's what campaigns do. So, how do people know that growth is shrinking or, or going up? It's because the campaign is telling them that. That's thing one. So if the fundamentals matter, I would argue that it's because we have candidates telling them the information that they need to, to know. They allow the conversation to be shaped uh, via agenda setting and framing. The candidates are telling us what they think is important. And there's good reason to believe that in this election, the fundamentals alone will not make a good prediction. Nor Pope the last prediction I showed you. He's riding that into the ground. He is going all the way with, with his model. But as I said, Abramowitz believes that his model is wrong. And these are the only two, this is crucial now, these are of nine prediction models that political scientists use. The two I've showed you are the only two that are predicting a Trump victory. To understand why that is, we need to look at the candidates and how they're conducting their campaign because 
very crucially, when you look at these models reported in the media, they're always dealing with generic Democrats and generic Republicans. And if we have learned one thing in this election, is Trump is not a generic Republican. And so let's turn to this notion of campaign effects. By campaign effects, we mean, we political scientists, we mean the impact that the day-to-day -day efforts of a campaign have on the election outcome the thing that you think about all the time. You're conditioned to believe that this is all that matters. Right? The media want you to believe that this is all that matters so that every day you tune in to the reporter that says, I'm standing here outside the Trump rally and something really awesome just happened and it's going to be a game changer. Right? That's what you hear. <laughs> and that's understandable that we believe that because that we hear that so much. And all of the money and all of the ads and all of the events and the goings on, we think it has to matter, right? Political scientists are significantly more bearish on this question than the general public. We think that campaigns probably matter a lot less than most people think. Some folks think they don't matter at all, some political scientists. But they do matter. I, I believe they matter in some conditions some of the time. But crucially for this election, Campaign effects are most important when the fundamentals predict a close outcome. And they're doing that, we've already seen. And that's precisely what we're dealing with. So now I want to turn to campaign effects as I see them relating to this race. And I'm going to begin with an example, then a case, but first the example. Picture this. The year is 1984. Ronald Reagan's first term, and the country is enduring the deepest recession since World War II. Nobody was, nobody was old enough yet to remember this, right? <laughs> One fun fact, my earliest memory of my life is the 1984 presidential election when my mom let me stay up late because there was something about it that just enthralled me. You know? and I shared that with you. <laughs> One year earlier, the unemployment rate had been as high as 10%. It climbed there on Reagan's watch, and the people noticed. In March of 1983, Half the country said their personal financial situation had grown worse during the preceding year. And in that same year, Reagan's approval rating sank to 35%. We forget that today. It's not a good fundamentals board. Double-digit unemployment, 35% presidential approval. And headed into the 1984 race against the former vice president, Ronald Reagan was in trouble. Right on cue, though, the economy began showing signs of life in early 1984, and the key job of Reagan's re-election campaign then became to get that information out to the public. This is a, an example of a campaign communicating the fundamentals to the voting public, and he began doing that what, with what I think is the greatest political ad of all time, which I'm going to show you now. The ad is called Morning in America. It, some of you will remember it. It's morning again in America. Today, more men and women will go to work than ever before in our country's history. With interest rates at about half the record highs of 1980, nearly 2,000 families today will buy new homes, more than at any time in the past four years. This afternoon, 6,500 young men and women will be married. And with inflation at less than half of what it was just four years ago, they can look forward with confidence to the future. It's morning again in America. And under the leadership of President Reagan, our country is prouder and stronger and better. Why would we ever want to return to where we were less than four short years ago? I give the inflection with the word and is that's the crucial moment of the ad. This ad is really effective at steering public attention to the fundamentals and then subsequently uh, telling you who gets credit uh, for the changes in the fundamentals. Despite the rosy rhetoric, so you know this morning again here's all the great things that happened and Ronald Reagan is the person who, who brought it to you and despite that unemployment in 1984 was still north of 7% which isn't good by any measure. But it was headed in the right direction. Reagan's ad plays on this sentiment that, hey, things are getting better. 
In other words, these ads can be effective insofar as they allow candidates to harness the fundamentals, framing their positions against the backdrop of what's happening in the economy. Ads are certainly intended to inform voters about elections, their background, their policy positions. Ads may not mobilize on their own. They may not people, get people out to vote, but they can help voters form preferences about candidates and they can shape how salient the election seems. In other words, the primary function of the ads is to inform voters about candidates vis-a-vis -vis the fundamentals. Does this work? That depends what we mean. Ads do appear to be reasonably effective at persuasion, but the effects are ephemeral. Most studies find that they wear off in as little as one to two days or at most two weeks. The best campaigns are therefore packaged around a theme or a brand that draws a distinction between the candidates, and this is crucial, that is sustained. And that last bit is really important. And so now I'm going to give you a, a case to think about. The 1964 presidential election has obvious parallels to today. The Republican Party fielded a nominee that had fractured support among its own base, who was accused of taking positions outside of the norm of the Republican Party and was labeled as many people as too extreme. Lyndon Johnson seized on this uh, to exploit uh, his opponent, Barry Goldwater's weaknesses in a sustained and unrelenting ad campaign. Now, I showed you a single ad and said, this is a great ad. I think it's a great ad. The 1964 presidential election marked the best ad campaign we have ever seen because it's wrapped up in a message. And you got a little bit of that last night. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. And so I'm going to show you three of Lyndon Johnson's ads to demonstrate how effective this can be if it does not let up. Back in July in San Francisco, the Republicans held a convention. Remember him? He was there. Governor Rockefeller. Before the convention, he said Barry Goldwater's positions can, and I quote, spell disaster for the party and for the country. Or him, Governor Scranton. The day before the convention, he called Goldwaterism a, quote, crazy quilt collection of absurd and dangerous positions. Or this man, Governor Romney. In June, he said Goldwater's nomination would lead to the, quote, suicidal destruction of the Republican Party. So, even if you're a Republican with serious doubts about Barry Goldwater, you're in good company. Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. That's ad number one. Here comes ad number two. This is the one I warned you about at the outset. We represent the majority of the people in Alabama who hate niggerism, Catholicism, Judaism, and all the isms of the whole world. So said Robert Creel of the Alabama Ku Klux Klan. He also said, I like Barry Goldwater. He needs our help. Uh, that ad cuts off, but as originally intended, vote for Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. All right, here's the third ad. I'm having technical difficulties. There we go. Oh, and now it wants to show us an ad. So I'll talk over the ad. You know, many of you know the frame. Okay. Uh, from Delicious. this, Ice and it's Daisy Girl, the most famous surprising. attack ad of all time, surprising? How much money Marin aired saved? only one time uh, because it was seen as too risky to air again.
Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. When I show that ad to students today, many of them don't get it. Those of us who lived through the, I mean, they get it, but they don't feel it, you know? And those of us who lived through the Cold War, and I grew up in Minot, North Dakota, which was the second target on the Soviet nuclear list. I was still doing fallout drills in 1988 in school. And so you know what that ad means. And Johnson's, in totality, Johnson's ad is wrapped around the political fundamentals of the race. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. We're going to push that theme across many different fundamental messages, but that is the message that I want voters to take if I'm Lyndon Johnson. And the lesson from that is that the most effective ad campaigns are unrelenting. What we complain about it, right? Every time I turn on the TV, I see political ads. The reason for that is because they need to be that way. And that is informative with respect to how campaign effects might shape outcomes in this election. If Clinton can sustain a campaign like Johnson's, she can gain a crucial preference advantage, I think. Now, Trump's media strategy has been anything but sustained. Yesterday, he promised to spend $114 million on on ads, but he doesn't have that much money in, in the bank right now. So he's relying on being able to raise it. And we've never seen such a spotty media presence ever. The story here uh, reminds us that he has stopped spending money for the last two weeks in the battleground states in the run-up to the debate. That's unprecedented. He just went completely dark. And if we believe everything we think we know, this should suggest that he has stalled any gains that he has made early in the election cycle uh, in shape, when it comes to shaping uh, voter preferences. And that really opens a huge opportunity for Clinton to reap campaign effects at a level that maybe we haven't observed before, particularly considering another forensic area that I'm going to show you right now, which is money. This is spending data, and fundraising data as of last week, and we see here that Clinton up top has been able to raise considerably more than Trump, which bodes well for her ability to continue outspending him down the stretch if this trend continues. And that's an easy thing to conclude, right? She's raising more money, so she's going to win. It's easy to conclude. And if you believe that ads are what matters, we're, we're about done here. I could start taking questions. But I need to push back on some more of that conventional wisdom. The supposition that the candidate who raises the most money will win is false. That is not a thing that we actually observe in presidential campaigns. I would remind you that Mitt Romney outraised Barack Obama in 2012. I could show you any number of other examples of this happening. We argue about the extent to which money does matter, uh, but I always tell students this is like an old physics vector problem. This candidate is spending money and this candidate is spending money, and if they both spend the same money, then the net effect is zero. It's only when one candidate completely overwhelms the other that money starts to matter. That's actually happening this time. We haven't observed that happening in a modern presidential election, at least since we started keeping track forensically of, of money. So the one thing I know is you're going to lose if you, if you can't raise any money. But that said, it's simplistic to make these conclusions based on fundraising alone. Campaign finance reports can tell us a lot, though, uh, and it's really useful to really drill down and look at them. My students, my summer class this year, got, they were very giddy when I told them that the top line item in Trump's expenditure report was hats. That's a true, true story. <laughs> that said, uh, <laughs> that said, Trump outraised Clinton on the last month. 12 million to 8.4 million in contributions from small donors. And if we buy into the momentum narrative, that's telling. Or it could point to his efforts at the thing that is really going to win this election, voter mobilization. And so I need to speak to that. 
for all the ads, all the yard signs, all hats, signage, the slick websites and direct mail. Political science has consistently found that the best way to win votes is to burn shoe leather. It's true in 1840, it's true in 1880, it's true in 2016. You want to persuade somebody to vote for you, you go and knock on their door and you have a conversation with them. This is, ladies and gentlemen, the most replicated and well-established finding in my entire field. That high quality, personal, face-to-face -face interaction is what wins elections. And by high quality we mean you connect with a person in an individual way. There are ways to do this on the phone, but the most effective way we have found in experiment after experiment is to do it face to face. So candidates who are willing to invest in that, even though it's not a sexy line item, uh, for, and the media is not going to report on the ground game as much as talking about your you know, big, slick new ad that you have, uh, it's really what wins. And so ads, the best way to think of this is the, the ads that you see and the ads that are talked about, that's your air war, right? Uh, but campaigns, just like a war, real war, are won by the efforts conducted on the ground. And forensically, we can get a sense of how the ground game is unfolding by looking at the expenditure report, and that's what you're now seeing a graphic of. I draw your attention to the orange column, which is payroll. Because if you're going to have people going door to door, you have to pay them. And we can see here, here's Donald Trump. This is, the size of the dot reflects the amount of money. He's spending almost nothing on payroll. Here's Hillary Clinton. Now we can look also at the amount of money being spent in other areas, events. Uh, that's, that's interesting. Um, travel, because he uses his own plane, he spends a lot more money. But for me, payroll is really telling because it suggests, it suggests that Trump is not investing in field at all. We know anecdotally that this is true. He said as much in his interviews that he's content to let the Republican Party do his voter mobilization on his behalf. But we can do even better than looking at the people he's paying. We can count the number of offices that he's opened. If we do that, we can get, a more, effect, we can get more evidence for what's going on. If campaigns are won by mobilization, and if mobilization is best achieved by face-to-face -face interaction, then this chart is hugely informative. I'll boil this down for you. In every state where it matters, every battleground state in this election, Clinton is outgunning Trump in the ground game. You can see the trends reflected in blue for Clinton and red for Trump, with the possible exception of Wisconsin. We see very little in infrastructure investment opening that county office. This has been hard for us to get an empirical handle on, but we think that opening a county office boosts turnout in that county by anywhere from one and a half to three percentage points. If you are highly effective at identifying and mobilizing your voters, this is how you win. And this will not be reflected in a poll. Bear that in mind as you consume that, that stuff. Nobody's talking about this because it's just easier to drool over the headline that says poll colon. Clinton lead, right? So just never, ever click on a link that starts that way. Just, <laughs> I will never read a story about one poll, okay? All right. But, so I think that this is possibly determinative. If the election is really that close, this alone could affect how the campaign unfolds in the battleground states. And so in this election, this kind of thing might affect the result. <laughs> but campaigns certainly don't matter in the way that the media want you to believe, right? That there is that great middle. I'm just reminding you now. There is no wishy-washy, there's no person going home and reading the newspaper and thinking, huh, which one of these people should I vote for? <laughs> the best way to understand how the fundamentals interact with a campaign is this picture. Now, you might, you may well, in this, this, in this picture, you know, we have a rugby pitch here, and the white team going this way, that's Clinton in this election. She's fighting an uphill battle because the economy is not amenable to her. It's just the, you know, Democrats have held power. Growth isn't where she'd like it to be. But if you come in with a good game plan, you can compensate for your 
disadvantage here in the slope of the pitch. And that's really how campaign effects interact with those economic fundamentals to produce an election outcome. So the answer is both things matter. And so why you came here is you want me to apply Acts 1 and Act 2 to Act 3. So let's get a little, uh, let's wade into this election and I'll start telling you uh, the things that you want to know. First things first, we need to calm down as a country. <laughs> we need to approach uh, these problems analytically. We can rely on our gut a little bit, but we really need to keep our head on a swivel and not act like it's the first time we've ever been through an election in our lives. There are no game changers. None. What you're seeing here are the predicted chances of winning throughout the 2012 election. You can see blue line top, that's Obama. We never doubted it, political scientists. Plenty of people in the general public did. You can see a couple of events here that shifted the race a little bit. This is 47% video. This is the first debate. Now, fun fact, last night's debate was scored as the, the third most lopsided victory in American history in a debate for Clinton. The most lopsided victory was the first presidential debate of 2012 where Obama seemed to be, he took like NyQuil or something before, <laughs> before the race. And so the fundamentals are probably more important most of the time, but maybe not this time. And that said, even this time we can fairly safely say that there will be no game changers. There's not going to be anything that, oh, well, if not for that one thing that happened, you know, Donald Trump would have won or vice versa. Uh, unless it's something major and unforeseen like a terrorist attack or some kind of, some kind of ep economic, that, that would really change the dynamics. And so we're waiting to see what effects, if any, the debate may have for public opinion. We already have evidence for fairly stable trends in this race. But you want to talk about the debate? I, I will talk about the debate. <laughs> On the bottom, so where do we go besides polls? I'll talk about polls, but where else do we go? On the bottom, we have uh, prices from Predictit, uh, which is essentially an online futures market. The price for a share of Clinton, you can buy a share in Clinton if you want. Uh, you're effectively betting on whether she'll win the, the race. And so if the, the election ends and she wins, you get a dollar on every share you bought. So if you buy a share for 64 cents, you're going to profit 35. So the best way to interpret those figures is the betting market's predicted probability of a Clinton victory. Uh, on the left, and so people are betting real money here. And so when people do that, they tend to make informed guesses and, and these markets, these markets generally outperform polls uh, historically, uh, especially over the long term of an election. The price that left right here, uh, that was Clinton's share last Friday. I went ahead and grabbed that so I'd have a, a baseline to compare. So that's before the debate. This is Clinton's price this morning. So we see here the betting market has given her a four point bump. Uh, in probability of winning. At top, we have the trend in predicted probability of victory for the two candidates from another firm called PredictWise. The data come from an academic named David Rothschild, and his uh, model factors these, get, these kinds of guesses, uh, plus data from social media sites like Facebook likes and, and Twitter mentions, as well as some polls. And these data tell a different story than the one you're seeing in the media about Trump's momentum in, in the weeks leading up to the polls. Clinton's probability has never really changed in this prediction market. It's always been higher than his. And so the lesson for me is clear. We can look at the fundamentals and predict that Trump is going to win, or we can look at different pictures that factor in other things, and we can reach very different conclusions in a forecast, depending on the stream of data that we're looking at. I just added this uh, slide to my deck about 10 minutes before I walked into this room. I already told you that the hot poll last night immediately following the debate showed a Clinton victory perceived by the, a representative slice of the public at 35 points. A couple of things you need to bear in mind when you look at hot polls uh, following debates. They are generally not representative, okay? Uh, and ne neither was CNN's. I looked at the crosstabs and it skews Democratic, so we should take a few points off of, of their result. Nonetheless, Nate Silver over at 538 was kind enough to put this 
figure out this afternoon which correlates the perceived result in polls like CNN's with the subsequent bump that a candidate gets in the polls after a debate. Now, her 35 point bump would put her somewhere right about here. So Silver is suggesting that she's gonna come out of this debate with a 2.5 percentage point increase in her uh, polling approval nationally, right? And so, should we use fundamentals like th these ones? Should we use the prediction markets? Well, I think the truth is usually in between two polls. And it's worth noting that five of the six methods of prediction that have been published so far predict a Clinton victory. It's only the economic fundamental models that do not. The truth is probably somewhere in here. And this is, these data are current as of today. Not reflecting the poll. All right? Let's enter, let's talk about polls though. And talk about how polls can be sensibly used uh, to think through an election. Now you know who this gentleman is if you follow po political news at all. This is Nate Silver, former baseball statistician, current election prognosticator. The strength of his method is that he uses polling averages over a period of time uh, instead of obsessing over the latest one. And it factors how the election is actually conducted, which is state by state. National polls make nice headlines, but at the end of the day, I really only need re returns from the battleground states to forecast the election. And if you're nerdy like me, you can say things like this. I don't focus on battleground states. I have battleground counties. <laughs> there are 10 counties in the United States that will determine the outcome of this election. In my professional opinion. Because this race, is coming down to this map. So I'm gonna go back to my slides and we can start talking about how that might occur. Right? Silver's method is important because it really forces us to, to think about the dynamics of the electoral college. These national polls, they don't tell us anything because they're gonna mix people from New Jersey in with people from Colorado and, and Iowa. And so when it comes to fundamentals, to me, if I'm going to do an election forecast, this is the penultimate one, a recognition of the battleground dynamics of the map. And so let's, uh, you want to game one out? Let's look at an election scenario. Now I want to tell you about Trump's path to victory so that you can know where this race is going to land. Here, if you want to do this at home on your own time, it's 270 to win is the website. I do this a lot, just at home. <laughs> my choices here will reflect my prediction for, for this race, given data as of this morning, i.e., my data do not account for any polling surges that Clinton may get. So I'm going to go ahead and give all of Mitt Romney's states to Donald Trump and some of Obama's states to Hillary Clinton. Now remember, I should put this up here, you need 270 electoral votes to win. And the race will come down, and this should shock no one who pays attention, to probably these states here. Now Nevada is trending for Donald Trump. I'm going to give it to Hillary Clinton for two reasons. One, Nevada, never believe a poll from Nevada. <laughs> it's the hardest state in the country to poll. The population is transient and nobody can get their likely voter model right. What I do know is that voter registration among Hispanics in Nevada is surging. And I also know how they're probably going to vote for that reason. I'm giving that state to, to, to uh, Hillary Clinton for the same reason I will give for Colorado. Her lead is such that I think she has very high probability of winning in Virginia. If I give Clinton Virginia, I have to give Iowa to Trump. All right, now remember, 270 is the number we're looking for. Does this look familiar? This election will be decided in Pennsylvania, in my opinion. 
Now, Ohio is tough. Ohio is tough. And you got to just stay with me. It's very, very close. Clinton has a lot more offices there. She's spending a lot more money there. And everything I think I know should suggest that in a month I could paint that state blue. Okay? But I can't do it tonight. I just, the data don't support that conclusion. And so, Pennsylvania, walking into this room, is too close to call. So I have the election at 259 to 259, with Pennsylvania determining its outcome. But it could also be Ohio. So now I want to introduce you to these two states. This is Ohio. Hello, Ohio. These are the places. Now, I give you this so that you can have fun on election night, regardless of what happens. <laughs> you can think, oh, I'm going to go and look at Lake County. That's how I do elections, right? <laughs> so when I forecast national elections, I always set up what I call barometers. Uh, I've also referred to them in the past as tsunami uh, warning, because if there's a wave coming, these, the bell will ring in these counties. So if you want to have a very sophisticated take on this election, I think that you should memorize these counties. Lake County, Ohio, very well could determine the outcome of this race. It went to Romney last time narrowly, but it seems like it's always the closest county in Ohio. It's right up here. It's a suburb of Cle suburban Cleveland County. Uh, it's suburban. It skews older on its demographics, and it's white but its population is fairly well educated. Um, as I said, Romney won this narrowly. If Clinton wins it this time, I think she will win not only Ohio, but the election. So if you look at Lake County, Ohio, I could be wrong. Uh, I usually am, but, but you know, it'll at least make the night more fun. Similarly, in Stark County, right here, which is home to Akron, it'll be interesting to see whether Trump's new voters show up. This is a blue-collar county where Obama squeaked by in 2012, but where I expect Trump's message to possibly resonate. So here, yes, we're looking at how Trump does, and if he does well, we're also looking at turnout. We have not been able to detect a surge of new registrants in many of the places that Trump is expected to do well. Don't believe these headlines that say Republican registration is surging. When we actually drill into the numbers, we see that there's no new voters coming in here. These are people who were registered Democrats and voting Republican anyway, so suspend that. But if Clinton wins Stark County, which is a place where I don't think she should win, given the demographics, I think we have to start questioning whether Trump's plan of peeling away white working class voters, is going, a Democrat, is going to work. If she wins Lake, and Stark, she will win Ohio. There are 800,000 or so voters in Hamilton County, home to Cincinnati. Obama rolled up big numbers here in 2012, but this time I think it'll be more swingy. Uh, Clinton must win Hamilton County, must win. If she can get to 52.5% of the vote here, I'm giving you these numbers, uh, Ohio looks safer for her. She did win the primary there against Sanders in a county with a heavy population of non-white voters. Finally, Clinton must get people out in Franklin and, and Cuyahoga counties. Franklin is Columbus, Cuyahoga is Cleveland. If we see vote totals in excess of 425,000 in Cuyahoga and 330,000 for Clinton uh, in Franklin, that bodes well for her. But as I think, as Lake goes, so goes Ohio in this race. If you see a lot of counties going to Trump on election night in Pennsylvania, it's okay <laughs> if, you're a, if you're a Clinton supporter. That's normal. And if you're a Trump supporter, too soon to celebrate. Clinton needs to run up numbers in Philadelphia and the suburbs, in Pittsburgh, and in Erie. And I think it's likely that Clinton will win only nine counties in the state of Pennsylvania. And you can see how many there are on the map. So it's the margin where she wins that will be important. If she gets 560,000 votes in Philadelphia, that's a number to watch for, and that's a good sign. Allegheny County, that's home to Pittsburgh, 
And like most large cities, Clinton expects to do well there, but there are also a ton of Republicans in this county, more than any county in the state, largely concentrated in the suburbs. Obama won this county with 57% of the vote, 2012. If Clinton dips below 55%, I'm, I'm thinking she's in trouble in Pennsylvania. Again, this really comes down to a mobilization effort. There are more than twice as many Democrats as Republicans here. So it's a matter of getting them out to vote. Registration trends have been even between the parties in Allegheny County, and this county is absolutely crucial for the campaign on both sides. But if Lake County, Ohio is where the magic is going to happen, Bucks County, Pennsylvania is where Pennsylvania will turn. Bucks is a swingy suburban county with more than half a million people. Obama won it narrowly last time, but by a lot less than he did in 2012 or in 2008. There are a lot of white working class voters in Bucks, as well as a lot of traditional mainstream Republicans. If Trump wins, it may signal that he's caught on with at least one of these groups, which will make me lean forward when returns come in from the great middle of Pennsylvania. Now, having worked races across the country, there's a great axiom among political consultants that Pennsylvania is interesting because you have Philadelphia here and Pittsburgh here, and in the middle is Kentucky. Right. All, of these, all of these counties will vote Republican in this, in this election. Democrats have always banked on Luzerne. Luzerne is a county I'm watching. It's coal country. It's not getting any younger. Obama won it with 52% last time, but I expect Trump to at least flip that and possibly run up more numbers. If he goes above 58 here, he may be riding a mid-state wave that could win him Pennsylvania. Republicans have registered 8,500 more voters than Democrats in Luzerne County this time. And so, I don't know what color to color Pennsylvania tonight. We have to keep watching about you know, how this election plays out, but I will give you these points as takeaways. To be a better citizen, What's going to determine this, this election, the fundamentals or the campaigns? I think clearly the answer is both. What polling should I look at? Well, I think it's, it may actually be too early to look at any of it this time. Close in battleground polling. When I say close in, I mean within two weeks of the election. We'll start leaning forward and believing the numbers that we see. I will continue to look at the campaign finance reports and, and office locations to try to get this right. The other thing that you need to know is every poll you've ever seen is wrong. Statistics is different than math in that we try to, be the, we try to arrive at the least wrong answer, not the right one. A generic Republican should be the favorite in this election, but I do expect campaigns to tr trump uh, fundamentals in this race for the first time in, in a while. And we all need to accept in this election that sometimes fundamentals will swamp everything else. It does it 85% of the time. Sometimes the best candidate doesn't win because the fundamentals just made for that field, the slope of that pitch, so steep that nothing could have affected the outcome. And so, I'm going to leave us with, you know, kind of a meme to understand how elections work. <laughs> Now, we know the serenity prayer, right? And it can be useful for us at trying times. If you are a political candidate, taking everything that I've told you here tonight about the awful lot of things that you cannot change and your ability to run against the fundamentals, we could alter this and create a, a serenity prayer for the, for the candidates themselves. Grant me the serenity to accept economic and political realities, courage to spend wisely, and wisdom to know when to keep my mouth shut, right? That's, that's what you want if you're a candidate. And for the rest of us, the prayer is simple. <laughs> Who will win? I don't know. Sorry if I went long. You've, you've stated as a premise that, that let me hear, uh, that there is no middle, that 
that there's not, it's not like there's a tug of war and there's a middle ground which people are trying to, to capture. But doesn't the fact that elections shift between Republicans and Democratic winners belie that? I mean, surely the reason that people shift to Republicans or the reason that people go for Democrats is that they're not necessarily absolutely wedded to what they think, the Reagan Democrats supposedly and that kind of thing. And so isn't there really a battle of ideas here that is significant? The notion of the Reagan Democrat is part of a, what we call a realignment that began in 1964 with Lyndon Johnson and the Civil Rights Act where the South really left the, the Democratic coalition. Now, I like to give students an awful lot of convention, or I push back against conventional wisdom. And one of the things that I tell them is it's a great myth that we have a two-party system. We actually have a three-party system where we have a very small party that caucuses and creates a uh, majority coalition government with one of the other larger parties. And you can think of the Dixiecrats in that way. They used to attach themselves to the Democrats, and then beginning in 1964, they attached themselves to the Republicans. But that has a long tail. And it took a long time for voters, it's still happening today, for voters to update their registrations to activate that new blinking identity. Uh, and so it was a process that needed to work through. We know today that in Congress, the parties are farther apart than they have been in quite some time. We know that most of this came from an apparent rightward shift among Republicans. And we also know that that was fueled by conservative Democrats leaving the Democratic Party and joining the Republican Party. So it may have been true for the last 30 years before 2008 that there was you know, voters in the middle. But I think most political scientists would argue that voters have quite efficiently sorted themselves into the, the correct party. In other words, if you're a liberal today, you're probably a Democrat, and that hasn't always been true. Um, and so these shifts that we've seen uh, are dependent on two things. One, people uh, updating these identities. And two, sometimes voters in one party are just not fired up for whatever reason. They sense that the headwinds are against them uh, or whatever. And so I think we can, we can, de I can, we can definitely defend uh, that model by conceiving of people as weak partisans who maybe you switch over and vote for somebody of the other party. many of the factors uh, that we need to think about, and in some ways was reassuring, um, and in some ways not. Um, one quick question before I get to my real question. On your economic models, the economic fundamentals, where was 2000, and in which way did it go? go all the way back. Because now, I couldn't tell if they were predicting the Republicans or the Democrats. We're talking about the GDP model? This, uh, this yeah, one right the first here. two models. Were, so 2000 is here. It lays off by a, you know, an error of about two and a half points. Um, because it, when you have the popular vote go one way and the election given to somebody else. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> there was a lot going on in 2000. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to about that. All right. But here's my real question. Um, I think that one of the most important things that you, that you emphasized was the ground game. And, um, and turnout, and we, we know that turnout is going to be critical. Um, to what extent should we be concerned that turnout will be affected by voter suppression acti <coughs> activities, which have been quite um, extensive for this election? That's my first question. My second question is, um, will we see a gender gap in voting, as we have seen in recent elections? Voter suppression. Uh, we have to be careful how we define that. There's a couple of ways to define it. I'll give you an administrative definition. Now, one way to understand modern suppression is we have to remember that the, the Voting Rights Act has been suspended by Shelby uh, in the Supreme Court, which if you read that opinion, Justice Roberts says racism used to be a problem. It's no longer a problem. The South is free to make its own election laws and release them without federal intervention to do that. And subsequently, we get a rash of 
fairly oppressive election laws coming from guess where? The South. We have seen pretty serious changes to felon, uh, who can, you know, can felons vote? Uh, in southern states, we have seen uh, new voter ID laws. You can, I think, defensively characterize this as a suppression, as partisan motivated suppression maneuver. Will it work? There is evidence that uh, voter ID laws do depress t turnout among African Americans and Hispanics to the tune of about two percentage points um, where, they, where they exist. Where should we be concerned about this, though? I mean, I hate to be very like strategic about, about it. We, that's, it's a completely larger and, and awful issue, but if we're talking about it in terms of how it affects the election, well, places like Virginia uh, and Pennsylvania, although the courts have begun to intervene in voter ID in a way that I didn't expect uh, very recently. Uh, other forms of suppression, well, Trump has suggested that poll monitors be sent out. We know his, this is consistent with things we saw in Jim Crow, and we know that it was, uh, that it suppressed African American votes uh, in those areas. I think that's it's something to watch and, 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 and think about. The flip side of the coin, by the way, is voter fraud, right? These voter ID laws are uh, often justified to prevent voter fraud. And the kind of fraud that they would present, prevent, voter impersonation fraud, um, it, it's not going to win an election. It's very costly. If you get caught, it's a felony. And you would have to impersonate thousands of people in order to do this. And there are legal scholars who keep track of people who've been prosecuted impersonating voters. And there have been more than a billion votes cast since 2000. And we are aware of, last I checked, 24 cases of voter impersonation fraud in the United States. Second question is about gender. There is uh, pretty strong evidence in political science for the existence of what we call an affinity effect. And this, uh, the, the theory is that women pull women, women as candidates pull women voters to them. This generally only flows though to Democratic women. And the theory is that it's easier for a Republican woman, woman because they're more liberal. They're closer to the middle of the political spectrum because women in general are more liberal than men. So they have a smaller distance to travel. So when Democratic women run, they have been successful in congressional elections at least, in attracting votes from people who would not have voted for them if they were not women to the tune of, again, about two points. So, but all of these two point effects start, can start can start adding up. Will there be an affinity effect this time? Well, you couldn't ask for better ground, right, to, for two better candidates to get an affinity effect than, than the candidates that we have. Yeah, go ahead. Donald Trump was going backwards and forwards in a word salad, but he seemed to have this theme of us against them, good versus evil, that I think people can really grasp onto. And whereas Hillary is just more nuanced and more difficult to understand, so is that going to play into the election? The first question is how third party candidates will affect the race. Difficult to know. Um, there will be a protest vote from both parties. There are plenty of Republicans who won't vote for Donald Trump. Where do they put their vote is the question. Now, strategically, if I'm a strategist, I love those people if I'm a Democratic strategist because if they go and vote for Gary Johnson, that's as good as a vote for Hillary Clinton, right? Because Trump is not getting a vote that he would have otherwise gotten. So taking away a vote from my opponent is just as good. The risk for the Democrats is that there are disaffected Democrats who, for whatever reason, will not vote for Hillary Clinton and will do the same thing. And those are the people that, that, that she should be uh, concerned about. I don't know what the answer to that is, and I don't know why, where it comes from. Part of it, I think, is because she's a woman. I mean, I think, it, I think it's, there's overt or you know, subconscious gender stereotypes, and uh, the positions that she takes have provoked a reaction that we, that we haven't seen. I tell the students to really think about their vote carefully in this race. There seems to be a cultural moment that we're in 
that we have begun to demand inspiration. And we say to ourselves, well, I'm not going to vote for you because you haven't moved me to tears during this race, right? And I don't know where that comes from. Um, but it's, it's a dangerous way to conceive of your vote, I think. I mean, I think voting is a five-second deal. You go in and you say, that one, right? You, hopefully you've informed yourself to make that choice. But I don't have good data to answer your question about who it hurts or who it helps. I would suspect, uh, based on what I know, that it will hurt Trump more. But again, I, but not in the places where if you're a Democrat, you would need him to be hurt. I think in you know, the white collar working class voters, they're gonna break for him, not Johnson. It's the mainstream Republicans that will go to Johnson. So I would expect a depressed vote because of Johnson in the, the suburbs. And the second question uh, remind, oh, was the, um, Us versus them, yeah. So you need to remember that Trump is campaigning as a populist. Now Trump's political ideology is best characterized, I think, as neo-fascist. <laughs> I'm not like I'm I'm putting him into an actual category just based on the positions that he's taken. It wasn't a joke. Uh, uh, he's running as a populist, and he's making an appeal, populist appeal, and he's doing this right out of the playbook of other populist candidates that we've seen. Now, Bernie Sanders ran it, had populist flavor too, but he actually had, you know, was running a very well-informed policy campaign, and that was the exception. Populists always point at something to be against. That's the name of the game. It's us versus them, and that's what you're seeing. Trump's uh, position just happens to be, I mean, you fall along race, racial and class lines, and those are chords that resonate with every American, which makes it easy for us to spot. Until fairly recently, it seemed to me that Florida was trending for Clinton, and then it changed. I'm wondering if you could comment on what happened. I don't know. It's been something that I've been looking at, and I don't know. But what I suspect is uh, two things could be happening. <clears throat> One thing that could be happening is that uh, Trump has somehow begun uh, really shoring up support in the northern part of the state. Uh, that's where his, his base will really be. Another thing that could be happening is that the polls are getting the likely voter model wrong. And so when we see, you know, 45% of Americans are going to support Trump, that's really the most important thing when you're looking at a poll. I want to know what's your likely voter algorithm. And nobody will ever tell you except the New York Times. They, they sit on these algorithms like, well, they're proprietary, right? And it could be just as simple as that. The pollsters are overestimating the propensity of voters in the northern part of the state to turn out. But I don't know. I don't know what. Um, I don't have a good, uh, any other answer. <coughs> A number of weeks ago, for the first time, I heard the news media talk about hacking with all these electronic voting machines. And that seemed like a real concern because it could happen in large scale. Can you explain how that would happen and what the likelihood is? Let me tell you why you should be very afraid. <laughs> this is my wheelhouse. This is work. That these are problems that I've been thinking about since 2000, maybe when I was an undergraduate. When you go to buy gas, if, unless you live in New Jersey, right? <laughs> you pull up to the pump and you get out and put it in, swipe your card, and the, the gas pump gives you a receipt. When you go to vote on an electric machine, you walk in, you pull the curtain, you genuflect before democracy, push the buttons, and away flies your vote, and you trust that that vote was correctly recorded. Now, last time I voted in New Jersey, which is where I live, I did on one of these machines. I walk out, I go to the poll worker, and I say, can I get a receipt? 
Her response is really telling about how election administrators across this country view this problem. She said, what could you possibly want that for? Now, you should be terrified about the possibility for shenanigans resulting from electronic voting machines. And if you don't believe me, Google a United States Senate primary that occurred in 2010, a candidate named Elvin Green, who spent no money, had no campaign, beat a well-established city councilman in South Carolina. He'd been a judge. He'd been out there running every day and beat him by 110,000 votes. I was asked to do a statistical analysis of this outcome, and I will go to my grave convinced that the elect whoever set up the algorithm to tabulate votes flipped the candidates. That's what my analysis suggested. Now, can I prove it? Well, the, the way that I did it is I took the paper ballots that came in an absentee, and I correlated the patterns across the, the state at the precinct level, and I found it was an almost perfect reverse correlation. And all it takes is one, one problem like that. The greatest enemy to our democracy is not fraud, it's incompetence. Now, we need to really think as citizens about the best way to do this because we very often have county clerks who know nothing about elections before they're elected. You know, constantly we're bombarded with these stories about ballot design and vote counting. And it gets worse. There was a computer scientist, I believe at Princeton several years ago, who gave an extra credit assignment to his class, he gave them a voting machine. Asked them to hack it. He said, whoever can do it this, in this, the smallest number of steps will get extra credit or something. They did it with a paper clip and a piece of gum in 11 seconds. They were able to reverse the vote totals. It gets worse. If you start thinking about how these are network, how these systems are networked and the ability for any entry point, uh, they were able, there have been people who have been able to show that you can just pop the lid off of these machines and upload a virus that infects, it spreads across the network and is untraceable. You should demand this. If we demand nothing else, this should cross party lines. This is urgent, in my opinion, because Imagine the constitutional crisis we will face when, and it is when, our voting systems are compromised in this way. The best way of voting still is on paper. Uh, Minnesota still does it this way. Minnesota has the highest marks for election validity in the United States. So this literally keeps me up at night. So I'm glad you asked the question. I'll take as many as you want. Uh, I have a question about, I guess, the, the underlying fundamentals that you started talking uh, about with us. You know, we could probably all agree on the number of years an incumbent has been in office. And a percent change in GDP is, is a fact that presumably we could all agree on. But it seems like increasingly even things like basic facts are being called into question or, or, you know, they're not affecting the country in the same ways. So, and then I, so I'm thinking, oh, maybe that gets into the campaign aspect of your talk, which is, I guess, spinning the facts or lying about them. But I mean, how does that, how, how does that affect the underlying fundamentals when you can't even, when a a percentage of the of the voting population won't even agree on the basic underlying facts. John Adams said facts are stubborn things, right? <laughs> they are becoming increasingly less stubborn. This is one of the symptoms of the problems that we or the phenomena that we talked about earlier, this notion of party sorting, where now we have very clear tribes of voters. We have the Democrats and we have the Republicans. There's a lot of things fueling this. You can, if you're a conservative voter in America, you can wake up, you can read the Wall Street Journal, turn on Fox News, drive listening to Rush Limbaugh, come home, watch primetime Fox News, go to bed. Never encounter a, a 
countervailing argument. And you can do the same thing if you're a liberal. And this is increasingly what we are all, if we search our feelings, what we're all self-selecting into. And so it becomes very hard to craft a good ar critical argument, one, uh, to have anything resembling a conversation instead of a fight, two. Uh, and but the, more, the most interesting answer is really that facts are not facts. Because there's a principle in psychology called motivated reasoning that's entered the way that we begin to, we have begun to understand how facts are actually employed in the mind of the voter. I do work in this area. And so the way that this works is if you're a Democrat, say, and I, the, the example that I always use in class because it's near and dear to me as a native North Dakotan is the, uh, the Keystone XL pipeline. Now, if you're a Democrat, you're pre-wired to think, well, there's, someone has told me that there's environmental degradation happening with this pipeline, so I'm going to be against this pipeline. And so when you hear a news story about the pipeline, what happens in your brain, there could be two facts. And the first fact will say the oil coming from the Bakken, where they're taking this out, is thicker, it burns worse, it's more emissions, and it's just bad. You will take that, you will put it in your brain, and you will use it at the barbecue, right? <laughs> and you might get another thing, though, that says this is going to have an economic benefit in the form of new jobs and maintenance and whatever that will benefit the local economies by $2 billion. That fact, because you're already predisposed, you're motivated to not like this, it hits your brain and bounces off. You never retain it. You never retain it. And this is the way I am aware of this. I know that this is a thing, and my brain works the same way. If we are motivated to a predisposed end already, we are actually incapable of absorbing facts. And so when we look at uh, the way that candidates and our politics are beginning to be waged, I can see it reflected in the two tribes of voter. Um, and it does not bode well for good two-way rhetoric. I think if we've lost one thing in this country, it's the ability to have that conversation with the person that we disagree. And my challenge to you would be to continue having the conversation. Don't give up. I think it's really important to continue the conversation. You can continue it with me on Twitter. I'm very active there. <laughs> but you should not shy away. You shouldn't delete people from the social media just because they're posting things that you find objectionable. Try to have the conversation before you delete them. You know, and if they're jerks, then, you know, at least you know. But I think we still have a lot to learn from each other, and we should go out of our ways to recognize that. That is the only way to solve that problem.